Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the Ilm Feed podcast. Um, however, slight change in setting here. As you can see, uh, we are on lockdown as it stands and uh, we are not in the Ilm Feed studio. I'm actually recording from my home today, as you can see from the background here. And uh, But you know, th- to be honest with you, we didn't want to stop the podcast. Uh, we have to keep it going somehow, inshallah. And uh, we're going to be doing it mobile today for the first ever time on the Ilm Feed podcast, inshallah. Uh, but we're going to keep things going. And I hope you are all well and keeping safe, inshallah. And I pray all your families are well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. And uh, we're going to get straight into it. We have a very special uh, guest with us today, a dear, dear friend of mine who I've wanted to get onto the podcast uh, for some time now. Uh, interesting mix today because he is actually an imam from Liverpool. Uh, which those of you who aren't familiar, up north uh, in the UK, uh, for those of you who are from outside of the UK. and But he's also uh, in his final year of medicine. So he's, a, uh, he's going to be very, very soon officially a doctor, inshallah. So he's got uh, an insight into both worlds because he's, he's an imam, uh, but also he's uh, been working in the hospitals. So with what's happening right now with COVID-19, the coronavirus, this pandemic, which has caused a lot of you know, panic throughout the world, subhanAllah. And many of us are quarantining, we're on lockdown. Uh, this is going to be really, really interesting to get an insight uh, with my dear friend, uh, Qadi Imam Hussein Anwar. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing, man? You okay? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing well. How are you? Alhamdulillah, man. Just keeping home, staying home. Yeah, it's, uh, staying safe? Yeah, staying safe. It's unusual, man. It's unusual, exactly. but um, we've got to do what we've got to do, man. Inshallah. Um, I was going to say, like, you know, this is, you know, you have the privilege of joining us for the first time ever on the podcast, which we're doing uh, mobile. Yeah. So that's that's interesting. It's interesting for me as well, just literally sitting here and trying to get this done. Yeah. Normally I'm in the studio and everything's perfectly done for me by the by our, our team, mashallah. Yeah. But yeah. here we are. Uh, in 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 lockdown, but uh, what's interesting is obviously Ramadan is literally around the corner now, yeah. uh, inshallah. And uh, you know, first and foremost, how have you just been generally finding um, the lockdown? Uh, how has it how has it affected you? It's affected all of our lives, yeah. to be honest, right? Yeah. Uh, how has it affected you in particular as an imam, and also because you're a you know you're at university in the final year of medicine as well. So how has that mix been for you? Yeah, um, alhamdulillah, it's been uh, eye-opening to say the least. Um, so I'm actually in my fourth year of uh, medical school, going into my final year. So I'm not, right now I'm not in my final year. Inshallah in September I'll be going into my final year. Um, sure. But in our fourth year we have our final examinations. Um, and in fifth year usually we just do placements and we're in the hospital just gaining experience, getting ready to go on the front line, go uh, into the hospitals and start working. Um, but obviously, because of what's happening right now, the structure has been changed a little bit. And inshallah, I'll be doing my exams um, later on in the year rather than this year in June. Um, so that's kind of what's changed for me. I would have been, you know, preparing for examinations right now. Um, yeah. And exams would have been happening next month. But um, alhamdulillah, you know, everything happens for the best. So now I've got more time to prepare and stuff. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like other commitments with the Imam and uh, you know the upcoming Ramadan, obviously we we all had a lot of plans, you know Taraweeh, mm. um, you know doing classes and and whatnot, teaching, all of that has now been you know rearranged. So yeah. most classes are now online that I'm teaching. Um, of course we know that most likely Taraweeh will not be taking place, which is unfortunate. Mm. But you know um, we have to. We have to do what the medical professionals are telling us to do, which is stay at home. Uh, we yeah. can't congregate. Um, so it is going to be difficult for a lot of us. Um, mm. and, I, and I think that generally a lot of people watching this, including myself, we take Ramadan as a spiritual boost. So come Ramadan, we like the unity aspect of everything. So we go to the masjid, we see everybody in the masjid, um, and we get that sense of community that maybe we haven't been experiencing throughout the the remainder of the year. You know, maybe we've mm-hmm. been busy prioritizing our work, prioritizing other parts of our life. But come Ramadan, everybody gets into that kind of mode 
and we think, right, now it's time to prioritize my deen, my religion. Um, and we tend to get a spiritual boost by seeing each other and encouraging each other to pray and encouraging each other uh, by seeing each other breaking our fast at Maghrib time by Taraweeh and so on. So that aspect, unfortunately, this year will be missed because we won't be seeing mm. each other. We, will, we won't be physically uh, be able to spend Ramadan, spend our iftar, spend our taraweeh together. So uh, that's going to be something that unfortunately we miss out this year. But on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of positives to be taken from this Ramadan, inshallah, as well. Yeah, inshallah. Yeah, I think it's just we just find ourselves in like a very unique, uh, like you said, it's unfortunate, very unique position. Um, like with Taraweeh, for example, um, obviously you've been leading Taraweeh for many years. I, I'm accustomed to leading Taraweeh yeah. for the last few years as well. And uh, it's weird to think about it. Like, you know, we're not going to be in the masjid. Yeah. We're not going to be leading Salah. And we're going to be at home instead. It is weird. And, and, and obviously, naturally, people are going to be upset by that. Yeah. Um, obviously, I think it's, it's been just it's been about a month now here in the UK mm-hmm. that we haven't been going for Jumu'ah prayers. Yeah. Most of the masajid have been, have been closed. And naturally, people have been upset by this. Yeah. Um, some people have still, mashallah, because of their zeal, they still want to yeah. go to the masjid, you know, they still want to pray. Um, but I mean, how important is it with like, you know, like I said, it's interesting because you've got both sides. You've got the, as an imam and from the from the medical background, how important is it to just follow this advice? Like, yeah, we know the virtues of praying in the masjid, yeah. the congregational prayers. But then at the same time, we've got our lives literally at stake here. Yeah. So where would you say the balance is here? I mean, in this current situation, um, kind of weighing up both sides, you know, the spiritual side and the medical side, definitely in this case, in the current situation that we are in, the medical advice does take precedence because we know that uh, as, as imams as well, I'm sure that we all understand that part of our faith is preserving life. That is one of the main objectives of Sharia after preserving your religion, as well as preserving your religion, preserving one's life is one of the main objectives of Sharia. Um, Mm. And literally we see every day on the news how many lives this coronavirus is taking. I mean, just in the UK alone, we know that the figures are now totaling up to beyond 12, 13,000 deaths since this whole pandemic started. Each year, sorry, not each year, each day, should I say, um, now between 700 to 1,000 people are dying every single day. Mm. So it definitely is a matter of life and death. And this is why we have to take it seriously. We know that in Islam, there is no compulsion. There is no kind of uh, uh, making people uneasy. Rather, Islam promotes ease. In the deen yusrun. So Islam tells us that even in a situation of life and death, for example, if a person doesn't have... Uh, halal food then we are allowed to consume uh, something haram for the sake of keeping ourselves alive yeah mm. so similarly in this situation we know that if we end up congregating there is going to be a risk to our lives people will die maybe if we yeah. as young people don't get affected because mashallah we are young we have good immune systems then the threat is going to be towards those who are elderly to those who are immunocompromised to those who have underlying conditions um, and we play a part in in, mm. in, in uh, safeguarding them as well So this is why it's very, very, very important To make sure that we listen to the medical advice You know, there's a lot of things on the internet It's very easy to get caught up in all of these kind of conspiracy theories You know, there's nothing yeah. out there You know, it's 5G, <laughs> it's this, it's that But, um, I mean, in, in reality We have to look at the facts over here And the facts are that People on the front line, i.e. the doctors, the nurses Are dying and we have to take mm. that seriously. Not only mm. not only them, but of, of course we see so many other people dying every day. But the fact is that they are dying trying to protect uh, people like me and you should we get ill. So in order to you know have some sort of respect for them and respect for ourselves and the authorities in the country that we are living in, we have to make sure that we adhere by the guidelines set out, uh, which is staying at home, you know, staying safe, mm. protecting our family members. It's unfortunate that a lot of people, well, not a lot, but I would say a minority of people may not understand the severity of what's going on simply because they haven't seen it affecting someone in their own family, let's say, for example. Mm. Or maybe they haven't seen it happening to anybody that they know personally. Whereas those who have seen it happening to their own loved ones, who have lost their own loved ones, and maybe they know their friends or family, anybody that are being affected by this coronavirus, they will understand the severity and they will understand the importance of staying at home and adhering by the medical guidance. 
Mm, yeah, I think super important, a uh, few of those points that you mentioned. Um, but yeah, especially just taking medical advice like seriously. Yeah. I think I think some people, they, they feel like somehow by taking medical advice, it negates their iman no. or it negates yeah. their faith in Allah or their tawakkul. Whereas no, we're taught, uh, you know, as, as human beings yeah. living in this world, we have to take the means. Yeah. Allah SWT has given us the means, 100%. right? And if the means is, you know, things like preventative measures, not going out, not shaking people's hand. I mean, we know generally, yeah, we would shake, you know, your fellow brother, or your yeah, fellow sister's hand. You know, you'd hug them. And this is Islam promotes that. But then, yeah. like, you know, I don't think we can get emotional here. No, no, no. Where, no, no, it's fine. If I do it, Allah will protect me. Because mm. I think that's not really quite understanding, you know. Yeah, no, actually, the, the, the Quran actually tells us all of these things. <clears throat> the Quran actually promotes us looking after ourselves. And yeah. the, there's actually three stages that are mentioned in the Quran about uh, how a person can... Uh, you know, look after himself in terms of medicine. So the first one is prophylaxis, prevention. So mm. Islam tells us that if something is going to be, you know, uh, harmful towards you, then stay away from it. Or, you know, you can do it at a later time. For example, let's take the certain verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that if you are ill or if you're on a journey, then just make up the number of fasts afterwards uh, during the mm. other days. وَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ In Surah Al-Baqarah, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this. So the traveler is allowed to break his fast during Ramadan to protect his health uh, in mm. case uh, the combination of fasting and the difficulties of travel weaken him and affect his health. So that's the Qur'an promoting uh, prevention of disease. And then the second mm. stage that the Qur'an promotes is maintenance of your health. Uh, and to remain healthy. Uh, and another example of that in the Quran is when Allah he says that if you are ill, if you are ill or you have an ailment in your scalp, then you should just pay fidya or or you should uh, you should observe fasts or, or give sadaqa or feed uh, you know six poor people or offer sacrifice. Mm. So you know all of these things they are telling us that Allah is allowing us to have the the ease in our religion and telling us that you know if something is gonna is gonna harm you then to maintain your health you're allowed to yeah. to defer it to a later stage or to have an alternative uh, and then of course uh, apart from prophylaxis prevention um, and maintaining your health if somebody does get ill the quran obviously promotes the fact that we have to go and seek medical uh, advice or we have to go and and, and carry out uh, the procedure that will help mm. us uh, recover ourselves for example uh, just this in the same ayah that I mentioned, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you have an ailment in your scalp, then you are allowed uh, to shave your head even in the state where you are in the state of ihram. And we know that in the state of ihram, you're not allowed to even scratch yourself in case hairs fall out. Whereas yeah. in this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing somebody to remove all of their hair to make sure that we are not affected uh, badly in terms of our health. Um, mm. By an illness that may be affecting us uh, in our hair, for example. So the Quran actually promotes medical well-being, uh, and, yeah. and 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 general and generally it promotes a good lifestyle. Mashallah. See, like that's amazing how the guidelines are literally all there in the yeah. Quran, even in the Sunnah. Like a lot of the government guidelines, it's funny that you know it's already in line, yeah. it's coherent with what the Sunnah promotes. You yeah. know, social distancing as an example. Um, you know, uh, regularly washing your washing yourself. Yeah. Obviously we. We have wudu and everything yeah, else, exactly. right? Uh, so all of these things are kind of in line, um, you know, not leaving uh, the land where there is a plague, where, exactly. where a disease like this has broken out. So everything is there. I think, <clears throat> like you said, um, I think it's really about just educating ourselves yeah. um, and ensuring that, you know, you know, even if we don't want to follow, if you, if you don't want to follow what the medical professionals are saying, actually, it's there in the Quran. Exactly. Uh, or exactly. There, it's, it's there in the Sunnah. Yeah, so, 100%. Yeah, really interesting. Um so yeah, I mean, we, we, we said that Ramadan is around the corner. So obviously with Ramadan coming up, naturally things are going to be affected. Yeah. Um, so things like taraweeh, um, things like just going to the masjid. And, you, and, you, and you've already touched on the communal side of things. Yeah. And Ramadan is all about community, um, iftar gatherings, taraweeh, and so on and so forth. Um, obviously the way, uh, like we said, things are going, um, we're not going to be able to experience that side of things. Yeah. So now I guess a lot of people are going to be asking themselves, well, does that mean my Ramadan is like going to go to waste now? Not does that mean my Ramadan yeah. is, is finished now? Like, yeah, it's not going to be the same, but I think a lot of people are feeling quite empty, yeah. uh, which is natural. Again, it's a natural feeling that I feel like maybe I'm still not going to be, going to be able to capitalize on Ramadan. Yeah. 
Ramadan is Ramadan Like obviously the blessings of Ramadan are there Exactly Ramadan is the same Like the rewards of Ramadan are there yeah. So that's what I wanted to, to go into now Is like What are some of the ways that you think That we can still maximise um, The rewards and the blessings of Ramadan um, Even if you know we're under lockdown And so on and so forth Yeah so You know We've mentioned about the fact that uh, in, in from a communal aspect, you know, unfortunately, this Ramadan we will be missing out on on the community vibe, on the community uh, sense of brotherhood and unity that we get in Ramadan. But uh, on the positive side, there's a unique way that we can benefit from this Ramadan in lockdown, in quarantine, in isolation, um, and that is from a point of self development because we have a lot of time on our own, and in isolation, when you spend a lot of time on your own. You have a lot more time to to think and gather your thoughts and to develop yourself in a way that you become a better person. There's many ways of doing that as well. So, for example, one of the ways that we can work on ourselves this Ramadan is working on our intentions. Because, you know, we are all kind of... Um, uh, we all end up falling into this trap sometimes where we do things maybe for the wrong intention. Mm. Not, none of us are completely you know, secure from that. Yeah. We all have this downfall where sometimes we do certain things and there's an element of maybe not doing it solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it's praying Quran in the masjid, whether it's offering your uh, you know, salah in the masjid, whether it's even taraweeh, whether it's leading or whether it's just going for taraweeh. Uh, maybe we go for taraweeh for the wrong purposes maybe it's more of a thing just to go meet our friends for example or maybe as someone leading taraweeh you're doing it because uh, you want to show that you've got a good voice or whatever yeah. so you know we are all kind of involved in this in some way or another and it's it's something that uh, you know we are we as humans are weak so we have to work on our intentions constantly constantly all the time whereas this ramadan we will have the opportunity to do this yeah. we will be on our own there will be nobody watching It'll be between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where you can really kind of think about, right, am I really doing what I'm doing for the sake of Allah? Nobody's watching me now. I'm on my own. Or for example, I'm in my bedroom. I'm in my house. Let's see how much Quran I pray now. Let's yeah. see how many nawafil I can pray now. You know? And more importantly, working on yourself in terms of character as well. And that involves the Quran. Yeah. Uh, that brings me on to my next point, which is, you know, building a real connection with the Qur'an during this Ramadan. We're going to have a lot of time on our hands this Ramadan, especially the fact that we're not going to be going to the masjid for taraweeh. So, uh, you know, naturally, that'll save us the time going to the masjid, coming back from the masjid. Uh, and, and and a lot of us, maybe who aren't hufal, will not be reciting the entire Qur'an in, in taraweeh. So it will be finishing a lot more quickly. Yeah. And for that reason, we will have a lot more time on our hands and that time shouldn't be wasted. That time needs to be used in some way or another. So the Qur'an is the month of the Qur'an anyway. We know that the, the Holy Qur'an was revealed in uh, the month of Ramadan. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. So there's, there's five ways that we can connect with the Qur'an in this month of Ramadan. And this is the five responsibilities that we have uh, to fulfill the rights of the Qur'an. That is. Yeah. So number one is... Believing in the Quran and honoring the Quran. Of course, we know that we have to believe in the Quran. Uh, so everybody, alhamdulillah, believes in the Quran, uh, you know, as part of a Muslim, that's part of our faith. Number two is re uh, reading and reciting the Quran. Now, there's a great blessing and barakah in reading the Quran in the correct manner. Mm. And it's our duty to recite it in the way that it was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, by Jibreel alayhi salam. Because the Qur'an is unique in the way that uh, it's, it's been preserved to the T. You know, exactly the way it was revealed is the way that we, re we should be reciting it today. Um, and, and it's part of our responsibility to uh, learn exactly how the Qur'an was revealed. And that's to do with tajweed. That's to do with learning exactly how each harf, each letter was pronounced. Mm -hmm. Exactly how each word was pronounced, for example. And this is part of fulfilling the rights of the Qur'an. Uh, so each one of us has, has a responsibility to ensure that we aren't neglecting this right of the Qur'an. So maybe in Ramadan, we can put aside some time to learn you know, exactly how to recite the Qur'an. Um, so that's the second responsibility that we have over the Qur'an. The third responsibility that we have over the Qur'an is 
understanding and reflecting upon the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. It's all good knowing how to read it. It's all good knowing how to recite the Quran perfectly. But at the same time, there has to be a balance between reciting the Quran and then understanding what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. Yeah. Um, and even uh, as a lay person, anybody can open the Quran and do tadabur and, and reflect upon the words of the Quran. This is not you know, exclusive for scholars. It's not exclusive for mufassireen. Anybody can open the Quran. It's, it's a conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and every single person reading it. Yeah. So, yes, we understand that if it comes down to uh, extrapolating laws from the Quran and extrapolating rulings of Sharia, then we must step back and allow the scholars to take over mm. and, and to extrapolate those rulings. But when it comes to mawa'idah, nasiha, uh, and, and taking inspiration from the Quran, then 100%, the Quran promotes that itself. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عَنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِي اخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا And in, in another verse of the Quran, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not, do they not ponder upon the Quran or are their hearts locked? Mm. So we don't want our hearts to be locked. In the month of Ramadan, shaitan is going to be locked up. Our hearts should be open, mm. inshallah. SubhanAllah, it's so interesting by the way, just on that point. How, because uh, you, you mentioned Tadabur is open to everyone and I'm really glad that you've mentioned that because again a lot of people think that it's only reserved for people of knowledge and you know ulama mm. and the elite yeah. when actually yeah. Tadabur, like you said, we're not talking about your making your mind up about rulings and you're following whatever you want to follow but it's more, like you said, taking inspiration uh, and the interesting thing about the verse you've just quoted there is that Allah says that, you know, or are there locks on their hearts? And not are there locks on their minds or on their yeah. aql and their intellect. So meaning that actually when you're doing tadabbur over the Quran, it, it doesn't require your mind. You don't have to be clever or intelligent to do tadabbur. Actually, if your heart is pure, then exactly. anyone, anyone with a pure heart, with a, with a sound heart, is yeah. able to take uh, inspiration 100%. from the Quran, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. In fact, you know, I was speaking to a few friends when I was back at university, you know, a few months ago. Mm. And one of my friends actually mentioned to me that you know, he had a habit of doing this where he would just open the Quran and, and just reflect on the verses that he's reading. Obviously, he'd have, have the translation in front of him as well. Yeah. And he was mentioning to me uh, a certain incident where he got into an altercation when he was at school with somebody. And, you know, as we do as, as, young, yeah, yeah. as youngsters, uh, got into an altercation, um, wasn't too happy about what had happened. And in his mind, he's thinking, you know, I really need to get my back. Um, uh, and I really need to get this, this person back for, you know, hurting me yeah. or whatever it might have been, whatever happened. And he said he came home um, and as part of his daily routine, he was opening the Quran. He opened the Quran and his eyes fell upon the word, verse in the Quran where Allah is talking about sabr. And Allah is talking about, you know, um, uh, he's telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that don't, uh, I don't remember the exact verse, but it's from Surah Al-Muzzamil, he was telling me. where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to, you know, have sabr and oh, yeah. um, have patience. And uh, and kind of endure what the non Muslims or the people that were you know uh, ridiculing him are saying, yeah. and Subhanallah, that really hit home for him because he thought, wow, I've opened the Quran and Allah is directly speaking to me at this moment in time. <laughs> um, so that itself is uh, it's, it's it's a miracle that we've got the Quran, and in every walk of our life, we can find a verse in the Quran that applies. Yeah, like, and it, and it didn't take a it didn't take a scholar or imam to exactly. to figure out a lesson on sabr or a lesson yeah. on shukr gratitude or you know tawheed oneness of Allah or you know respecting parents or being good to your neighbors like this is all in the Quran so these things yeah. it doesn't require you know us to really think about or us to come to a conclusion or a ruling actually these are yeah. just general points that everyone can learn because the Quran yeah, exactly. is universal yeah. the Quran was revealed for humankind. It wasn't revealed just for mm. the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar and that's it yeah. and not for the yeah. you know Bedouins and not for anyone else. Mm. So yeah, amazing yeah. point. So sorry, you were, you were going through your list. Yeah, so um, so I just finished off number three which yeah. was uh, understanding and reflecting and doing tadabbur upon the Quran. Then of course after you've understood the Quran, you've, you've got the message of the Quran, mm. then naturally the next stage is to actually implement the message of the Quran. So if Allah is telling you, for example, to do sabr, then to actually do sabr mm. and implementing all the guidelines, all of the rulings uh, that the Quran is telling us. And then finally, conveying the Quran. Now, this is an important um, kind of aspect uh, and an important responsibility of the Quran as well. You know, a lot of us will think, oh, 
does that mean necessarily that I have to go and teach the Quran after I've learned every verse? Mm. Or does that mean I have to go and start teaching Tajweed if I've just learned Tajweed? Does that mean, for example, if I've learned to do Sabar, straight away I have to go tell people, right, you do Sabar as well. Mm. And uh, so does it actively mean doing that? And the answer to that is not necessarily yes, we can do that, mm. but not necessarily. Uh, and I wanted to relate uh, and narrate the um, the saying of Aisha radiallahu anha. When uh, somebody asked her that, can you describe the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to us? And he said, uh, sorry, she said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ That his character was the Qur'an. Meaning he was a walking, talking embodiment of the Holy Qur'an. Everything he did was in accordance to the Qur'an. Everything he said was in accordance to the rulings uh, and, and the message of the Qur'an. Mm. So just by being ourselves, just by being good people as the Qur'an promotes, just by having good character, just by being sincere, not cheating, not lying, not you know, uh, uh, being a, a nuisance to our neighbours, for example. For example, removing something from the street that is harmful for anybody else that's going to pass by. Mm. All of these things that are mentioned uh, in the Qur'an and the Hadith, by being an embodiment of these things is what is meant by conveying the message of the Qur'an. We can be that as well. Mm. Yeah, now some excellent uh, practical uh, tips there with the Qur'an. Like you said, uh, Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. And naturally because, for example, we don't have to go to the masjid, we don't have to pray tarawih in congregation, naturally that means it's going to save us a lot of time. Not that the yeah. time spent there is bad, but you know, now naturally you're just like, it, it, you don't, you're not going to come home late, you're already going to have your iftar, mm. be at home and pray. Yeah. And naturally maybe your prayers aren't going to be as long as would take in the masjid. Yeah. So I think, that extra time, you're going to have an extra few hours now. I think you can invest that time, like you're saying, into your own personal connection with the Quran. Uh, and, you know, like you said, uh, reading, but I'm so glad that you mentioned the reflection and tadabbur side, um, as well as the implementation side, because I think I think what re always happens in Ramadan is we're so focused on doing a khatam. Yeah, One khatam, exactly. next khatam, next khatam. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, yeah. like we know it's from the Sunnah. Process I'm used to. You know, recite to Jibreel alayhi salam, right, uh, before he uh, passed away in the final Ramadan, he read it over twice. So we know it's important to do khatam of Qur'an, but you know when you get so focused on just yeah. read, 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 and you're just like, you know, zooming through the whole thing, yeah. absolutely no contemplation, you, you don't have no... So by the end of Ramadan, when you ask that person, okay, so what did you achieve this Ramadan? They're like, yeah, yeah, I did three khatams, four khatams. Yeah. And then, and then you're like, khatams, but yeah. did you, have you improved in your character? Mm. Do you feel any better? They're like, no, not really. It's just, it's just, I can yeah. say, it's like, you know, I can tick it off the list kind of thing. Yeah. You don't want the Quran just to become a ritual. Yeah. You want to actually uh, get something out of reading the Quran. And that's, yeah. you know, the, the remaining points that have just been mentioned. So, subhanAllah, there's a lot of, yeah. There's a lot of things that we have to do in order to strengthen our relationship mm. with the Qur'an during this upcoming month of Ramadan. Yeah, so, uh, you know, as, as we said, the whole khatam side of things, uh, it's important, but yeah, definitely, I think contemplation reflects. I think even in general, you know, um, the fact that we're, we're now finding ourselves in solitude, a lot of us, we're having to self-isolate. We've been forced to literally self-isolate or we're finding that we're not allowed, we, we, you know, we're not able to now go out and connect with people. Uh, this also has a great spiritual, um, you know, ripple effect on an individual. The fact that you're able to spend more time with yourself now, yeah. and you're able to think, and you know, like you know, there's a whole concept of muhasaba in our deen, yeah. which is like you know, self account and introspection, yeah. and you know, figuring yourself out. Because at the end of the day, like if you don't know where your weak points are, um, then how are you ever going to improve those? And really, the only way that you can, you know, uh, identify and pinpoint your weak points is actually just just by thinking about it. Yeah, hundred percent. Obviously, unless unless someone points it out for you. Yeah. But you know, when you're by yourself, you just think to yourself, okay, where am I going wrong? Where can I improve? Okay, you mentioned about Quran. Actually, you know what? Am I reciting enough Quran? Am I thinking about the Quran enough? You know, my salah is it like all over the place? Mm -hmm. You know, what am I doing? So I think that also. What are your thoughts on that? The fact that you know, because you mentioned at the beginning, reflection, seclusion, and stuff like that. How important is just spending time? To yourself, especially in the day and age where we've got every every time connected, isn't it? Yeah, you know, we've, no, we've got yeah. one camera on or some Instagram or something is going on. Yeah, no, you're you're definitely right about that. We've got, like you mentioned, a lot of time, 
Um, and muhasaba was a word that really stuck out to me, what you were just mentioning over there. Mm. Muhasaba means obviously accountability, self-accountability. Um, so that means obviously, uh, it, it reminded me of one of the scholars uh, who used to, before going to sleep every night, he, was at, he would actually do muhasaba and he would, he would think about the good things and the bad things that he's done throughout the day. And then he, mm. would, he would think, okay, well, all the bad things that I've done today, they can't happen tomorrow. And all of yeah. the good things that I've done today, good, but we're going to increase on those tomorrow. And if we start to implement this in our daily routine in Ramadan, then inshallah, our Ramadan would be very, very fruitful. So muhasaba mm-hmm. is going to be something that we can definitely implement in our, in our daily lives. And that also ties into the whole purpose of Ramadan, actually. The whole purpose of Ramadan is mentioned in the Quran. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ so that you mm. become more God conscious. And what are you doing when you are taking account of yourself? You're actually becoming more God conscious because you're thinking, yeah. what will Allah be happy with? And what will Allah or what has Allah not been so happy with what I've done today? And how can I rectify that? So you're actually achieving um, that, uh, you know, that objective of Ramadan. Now, uh, even fasting itself, a lot of people, when you ask them, um, why do you fast as a Muslim? Then the, then the common kind of answer to that is, oh, we're trying to um, feel how the poor people mm. are feeling in, in these countries, yeah, yeah. which is which is not so correct in its entirety. It's not primary. Basically. It's not primary, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the whole purpose of fasting in Ramadan is what Allah has mentioned in the Quran, which is uh, uh, God, more God consciousness. How are we getting God consciousness from keeping ourselves hungry throughout the day or, you know, staying away from certain things that we could have done if we weren't fasting or, you know, um, being more wary of our words, making sure that we aren't vulgar, all of these things. Um, yeah. One may ask, how is that going to affect, can't, be, can't that be done without fasting? You know, mm. can't that be done without fasting? And the answer to that is that fasting actually helps you to become more God conscious. And the reason why is because you are preventing yourself from doing certain things which normally would have been halal for you. For example, yeah. you know, uh, eating, drinking. This is normally halal for us. But we have, we, we have stopped ourselves from eating and drinking and we are disciplining ourselves throughout the month of Ramadan. Whenever we go to try and eat, whenever we go and try to drink, we remember, no, I can't eat and drink. Because I'm fasting. Why am I fasting? Because Allah has told us that we have to fast in the month of Ramadan. So this mm. this is actually subconsciously building up a sense of God consciousness. Because straight away, whenever you go towards food, whenever you go towards drink, you're thinking, no, I can't do that. Allah has told me not to do that. Um, and when you do that for 30 days, you're constantly thinking about Allah whenever you go towards something. Yeah. So so that can be uh, that, that can be shifted over to a lot of things in our lives as well. So um, even beyond Ramadan, whenever we do something, we should ask ourselves, is Allah going to be happy with this? Should I be doing this? Should I not be doing this? And in this way, yeah. we are subconsciously, without even knowing, we are building God consciousness and taqwa. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Really interesting point there. Um, I was going to also ask, just with, with some last few points, uh, with, with Ramadan coming up now. Um, firstly, from let's let's start from the health side of things. Then I'm going to come to... Um, the more spiritual side, some yeah. final, uh, you've already mentioned Quran, so, so final tips. So from a, from the health side of things, um, obviously food, drink, we're cutting down anyway, or supposed to be cutting down, yeah, yeah. but obviously sometimes it's actually double intake yeah. for <laughs> a lot of people in Ramadan. Yeah. So uh, is there anything that maybe we should just be wary of going forward, especially with the current situation, the current cr- uh, situation that we're facing yeah. with uh, COVID-19? Anything that you would give as final advice going into Ramadan, to refrain from or even with the diet and things like that yeah well uh, look um we we already established um through research from uh, you know the professionals and and so on that covid-19 coronavirus uh is generally affecting people that are either elderly or people mm-hmm. that have underlying health conditions and that amplifies the importance of staying healthy uh so islam already promotes healthy lifestyle in fact, Allah says in the Quran, كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا So we tend to always focus on the halal part, which is important, of course, but we tend to overlook the طَيِّب part. Uh, yeah. and, and part of طَيِّب, 
but part of eating something tayyib is ensuring that it's you know organic and uh, you know it's something that's going to benefit us um so that's something that we really need to take into consideration um it's very easy to fall into that trap of you know opening your fast with a load of uh with a huge meal um which is not from the sunnah uh, mm. it, it kind of defeats the purpose we have to be balanced in everything that we do open your fast but open it with a, a normal sized meal uh and and we remember the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam where he advised to keep one third for food one third for water one third for air and mm. and uh, uh, so if we take this into uh you know we we take this into consideration and we actually look at the medical research behind it uh, subhanallah so many things that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam advised us to do 1400 years ago they are being proved by science now today 400 for 1400 years later so uh, th- we need to follow the sunnah essentially mm-hmm. Jazakallah khair uh, for that uh, and for all your advice and for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Obviously, like I said, it's the first time that we've yeah. tried something like this out. Um, so Jazakallah khair for your Allah time. Allah and uh, may Allah reward you and uh, hope you have a blessed Ramadan with you your well. family. You as well, inshallah. And uh, yeah, Jazakallah khair. And thank you to all of our Ilmfeed uh, viewers and listeners uh, for tuning in. Once again, hope you all stay safe. Hope you all have a blessed Ramadan. From your host, Shabir. From Qadi Hussein, we will see you another time, inshallah. Take care, make dua for all of us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.